Yeah. Upon entering the venue this afternoon, on the left-hand wall, you will have seen this year's NAIDOC theme was honouring our elders. Every Tuesday afternoon, this, home, this room is home to the club's homework program, bringing some 50 students from schools all over Shepparton together. For NAIDOC week, they were asked about their elders in their lives. My granddaughter, Nira, wrote on her poster about her nan and pop that she learnt respect and that she loves us very much. These posters are a quick glimpse into the lives of a primary school student and it's heartwarming. If you get the chance, make sure you have a look. Also, every Saturday during the season, this room transforms into an art gallery with, with the support of Polyglot. The, last, the la last Saturday here was the opening of the Rumba Art Gallery and Gift Shop. You could purchase art from our Rumba artists and also buy a cup of kindness. Melt your heart. The kids who are writing these stories are writing about their elders and their ancestors and the thing about Aboriginal communities are they are the features on our club's nanyak, the wall at the back of the building here. These are the kids who are going to be impacted by the overarching theme for the 2023 Dungala Kiala Oration, which is recognition through a voice. In the coming months, Australia will have their say in a referendum about whether to change the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. <clears throat> the voice would be an independent and permanent advisory body. It would give us advice to the Australian Parliament and Government on matters that affect the lives of only Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The Kaila Institute, in association with the University of Melbourne, is delighted and honoured to present Megan Davies, the 2023 keynote speaker. But before we get that started, we have some very fo important formalities. So I will begin by acknowledging our elders and community members in the room. It's always tricky to mention people by name because there is always the risk of missing someone who's very special and important. My sincere apologies if that does happen. Here we have Uncle Paul Briggs, Uncle Cole Walker, Annie Rochelle Patton, Annie Laura Robinson, Annie Amy Briggs, Joycey Doyle, Jane Muir, Travis Morgan, Chair of the Manara Centre for Regional Excellence, Joshua Atkinson, President of the Rumbalara Football Netball Club and his board, Felicia Dean, CEO of the Rumbalara Aboriginal Cooperative, Councillor Greg James, Chair of Rumbalara Aboriginal Cooperative, Deborah Cheatham, OIM, Professor Megan Davies, who is our keynote for this evening, Councillor Seema Abdullah and Peter Harriet, CEO of the Council. First People's Assembly of Victoria, we have Kochar Nagara Murray and representatives Alistair Thorpe, Belinda Briggs and Levi Power. We have a long list of distinguished guests joining us from the university and I would have been here all night if I was to mention everyone by name. But a warm welcome to Jane Hanson, the Chancellor, Professor Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor and Provost Professor Nicola Phillips. And finally, we'd like to acknowledge all of the people joining us from the digital world on the live stream. I'd now like to introduce or thank Uncle Cole Walker, our respected elder and our knowledge holder for the Yorta Yorta people. He's a gentleman and an incredibly incredible storyteller with a wealth of experience that he generously shares. It was through the advocacy of our elders and their struggles to ensure the change was for the betterment of the Indigenous families and to help build a better future for our communities. With him is Dixie Patton, a Victorian football legend and current reserves coach of the Rumbalara Football Netball Club and a craftsman. We also have Belinda Briggs, who's a board member of the Rumbalara Football Netball Club, elected member of the First People's Assembly of Victoria, all here to perform a welcome to country and smoking ceremony. So the welcome to country ceremonies are part of reconciliation as they acknowledge the traditional ownership of the lands, events that take place on their land. They are performed by a senior and respected elder of the Yorta Yorta Nation. Smoking ceremonies are ancient and contemporary. They are a custom among some traditional owners that involves smouldering native plants to produce smoke. The herbal smoke has both spiritual and physical cleansing properties and the ability to clear the space and ward off bad spirits. I'd now like to call on Uncle Cole, Dixie and Belinda to do the welcome.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Colin Walker. A yorta yorta, Mora Yalaba. And uh, also, Muna Kala Mission, Aboriginal Mission in Wemba Wemba, Denelpan is my mother's country. So I got two lots of land that I really respect and go and visit whenever. I live at Kamraganja. I was born there just nearly 89 years ago. My grandmother was the midwife. Delivered me, not only me, a lot of others. And um, I'm flooded out. I'm living in Echuca. And in my 88 years, it's the longest I ever lived in a town. So I'm threatened to get back home, me and my dog and my wife. But Kamraganja is means our own to all of us. Not just because I'm an elder. I don't own Kamraganja. We all own Kamraganja. You know. So anyways, I, uh, I'll be moving back probably next month so I could eat my traditional food, which I'm used to, making my own ointment and oils and stuff like that. That keeps me going, I think. And at my age, I'll touch wood. <laughs> I'm not on any tablets yet at my age, but I think probably next year I'll be rattling with them. But, you know, <laughs> But the doctors offered me tablets and then I said, no, I want my traditional things. I, I live off the land. I'll get plants and that and mix and stuff like that. The younger ones will learn all that. So anyways, Shepparton is another home to us. And I've had a good life on, um, me and the wife's been married just on 67 years. So I'm a gay man to be with one woman for that long. And, so that's two life sentences for me. And uh, so she's a Raradri woman. And my elders, when I brought her down to Kamraganja, they looked after her. They knew she was a young woman from a different tribal area. And they looked after my wife, yeah. So anyways, I won't say much more because anyone wants to ask me questions after I talk to them, but I think I've said enough. But Kamraganja, you know, is a home. And after the walk off, a lot of our people still come back to, our, to be buried at Kamraganja. That's their rights. I've been, had no education. I was expelled from school when I was 13. And my punishment was straight out in the shearing sheds. And I didn't go with my father, because none of you listen to your father, though. But and uh, I went with my uncle. And um, then, uh, you know, I learned to be a shearer for about 20 years or more. And then I was cultural heritage inspector without education. My university is out in the forest. But sitting on the Koori course for 16 years was a big challenge to me. I knew how to talk my law that I learned from my elders. That was my... Uh, scientists, professors, and lawmen. And I knew how to talk to our young men and women when they come before me, you know. And I learned that from my elders. So thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you. Kanya, Yubuga, Nga, the Belinda Briggs, Nini, Gunya, Dungala, Taylor Waka, Nini, and Benamois Ruben Williska, Yorta Yorta. Good evening, all. My name is Belinda Briggs. My home is the Goulburn and Murray River country. My ancestors, Moira and Walithika of Yorta Yorta. Thank you to um, Dixie for cleansing the room. 
the smoke of the gum leaf and those beautiful words from Uncle Cole. Um, just really precious and um, savour um, hearing it all and um, holding it forever. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my elders and my father here before me and um, all our special guests here with us this evening. It's a privilege to share this moment with you all and um, including our special special guest, Professor Megan Davey, here in the room with us this evening. It's a privilege and honour to host you here on Yori Waka and share this page of the unfolding story across the country that is being written here with you this evening. This speech is a little bit old and a little bit new and bear with me. I did write it very last minute. That seems to be my thing. So I hope it makes sense. Um, some people call what I do a welcome, others an acknowledgement. I think of it as my role to introduce you to country and country to you through me. And um, Uncle Cole has already done that and so I do that building on um, those that have gone before me that come through me. Um, country being not just the physicality of the land but all that it encompassed from time past to today and the thriving connectivity of our relationships inclusive of land, water, sky, animal, plant to each other as yori yori people. It is a gesture that orientates us, locating us here together and giving context to our relationships. Relationship to the land under our feet, the cultural, social, historical significance of this room and to each other personally or professionally. This practice is intended to give visibility to each of us in relationship to place and each other, setting a foundation of common values from which we may then continue building respectful relationships and enjoying the fruits of whatever that may be. This is particularly significant to consider in this time in history with momentous shifts happening across the social and cultural landscape, not unlike the uplift of the Cadell Fault some 10, 15,000 years ago in what is known as the Kumragunja farmer area today where the Murray River or Dongola flows and Uncle Cole you can correct me on <laughs> this next little bit that um, I'm about to share because sometimes I'm not the best storyteller I have to say and I do rely on those around me but um, for those that don't know the Cadell Fault was an earthquake and um, it you know disrupted the course of our rivers and created an inland lake that rose to the tops of the trees and caused havoc for Yorta Yorta people. Back then they took the future into their own hands, as they always had. The women, as I have been told, used their digging sticks in the soft sand hills that held the water in to release it and change the course of the river and, you know, thereby um, bringing back the land that the lake was covering. And um, changing it, changing the course of the river to that we know it as today. Taking the future into our hands is what we have always done, what we strive to do today and what we are passing on to the next generation for their tomorrow, both on and off the court at Rumbalara and the soon to be Manara. You only have to look around the room to see where and when we took the future into our own hands, the collective and individual success that the act that that act of living generates and, and how we take that and invest it into the aspirations and vision we have for our families and community. This way of being in the world is evident through the leadership of our ancestors over the last 190 odd years of colonisation here on Yorta Yorta country. Thanks to the work of Uncle Wayne Atkinson, his research, I can share with you, it is recorded as early as 1861, our desire to retain our sovereignty and right to self-determine when it was made known, made known to a representative of the Aboriginal Protection Board who, who reported, 
Since the Murray has been navigated by steamers, the natives have found it scarcely possible to catch fish. Heretofore, their chief means of support, a native of the Moira, Yorta Yorta, who rode up the Murray with me, informed me of the intention of himself and five other Aborigines to proceed as a deputation to His Excellency the Governor to request him to impose a tax of £10 on each steamer passing up and down the Murray to be expended in supplying food to the natives in lieu of which had been driven away. Some 20 years later, a petition was put to the governor at the time by 42 residents of the Maloga mission, requesting a sufficient area of land to cultivate and raise stock that we may form homes for our families. A few years support ourselves by our own industry. They asked this as compensation because all the land within our tribal boundaries had been taken possession possession of by the government and white settlers. Over the course of this short timeline, there have been some 20 documented assertions and claims to our waka in the form of letters, petitions and claims through the courts. Today, as we will hear from Professor Megan Davies in a moment, the significance of this impending opportunity before us, that of the referendum, we can consider our own position in the world, how we got here, how others got to where they are, and how this might inform the future we all stand to inherit and leave to our children and grandchildren. Will it be a better place and for who? The answers to these questions will lead us to our answer. The following words are not said without mixed emotions of joy, grief, resentment, pride, profound appreciation for the fragility and origins. It has not been without sheer determination, resilience, sacrifice. I love all these words. And in the process of sharing them, connect us all to here and now, which if you haven't picked up on encompasses the past and future shared between all of us. Now is the tension between yesterday and tomorrow. We are bound to this land in spirit, memory and blood. Our old people's bones lay in the earth, their spirits watch over us and we remember them by practicing what they showed us. Love, humor, kindness, discipline, strong will, respect, integrity, their intelligence, ingenuity and spirituality. In their own right, they were master crafts people Songwriters, singers, dancers, designers, doctors of medicine, biology, astronomy, engineers, law keepers, teachers, warriors and more. Adept students and practitioners of the law of our creator spirit Miami. The land, its waterways and everything that belongs. This is who we are. Our being constituted by the continuity of this web of deep connections. Made of family, land, waterways, animals, plants, the sky, and everything in between, stretching into the deep past and already written far into the future. This is our belonging. This is what we want to take into the future. Those things that tell us who we are, where we are from, where we are going, how to get there and what with. We gather here this day in the spirit of our ancestors. Give love and respect to our elders, past and present, and ancestors born of this country that lived and walked here on Yorta Yorta country since time immemorial. We remember them in our hearts. Thank you. I'd just like to thank Uncle Colin Walker, Dixie Patton and Belinda Briggs for that incredible welcome smoking ceremony 
and the words uh, Belinda always delivers are so beautiful and a, a big part of the Yorta Yorta vision is to disassociate ourselves with that de deficit narrative that's followed Aboriginal people since colonisation. It is my honour to introduce tonight's co-host to this event, Uncle Paul Briggs, OIM, the Executive Chair of the Kayla Institute and founding president of the Rambalara Football Netball Club, among quite a few other titles, and Professor Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne. To most of us here, Uncle Paul Briggs needs no introduction. He is a pivotal figure in the Yorta Yorta and First Nations community. He is both an intellectual teacher and cultural mentor. He has worked tireless, tirelessly over many decades with a single-minded purpose to restore the rights and standing of Yorta Yorta people. He has been instrumental in the development of the Manara Centre for Regional Excellence and has co-chaired the Goulburn Murray Regional Prosperity and Productivity Plan, which makes the region responsible for restoring a thriving First Nations economy. He is also chairman of the Australian Football League's National Indigenous Advisory Board. Similarly, Professor Duncan Maskell has been a strong and influential supporter of the University of Melbourne's foundational role in partnering with First Nations communities here in our region. He, beling, he, he brings a personal commitment to the opportunity education can provide and also brings insight and leadership to the evolving partnership at the Manara Centre for Regional Excellence, which we are all very excited about. The new building has commenced and the centre is on track to open in 2024 as a transformational First Nations-led institution for pathways training and higher education. Please welcome Uncle Paul and Professor Duncan. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep this really short, but it's a, just an introduction I suppose, to tonight's event or tonight's conversation, um, which talks to the future of um, our people and Australian society and the importance of um, what's happening in October in relation to the referendum and the uh, acknowledgement of a principle of the place of First Nations peoples. Um, and I'm really privileged, feeling really privileged to have Professor Davis here with us, um, the co-author of the Uluru Statement and um, one of the fighters in the, in the, in the push for the referendum. Um, and we're looking towards, you know, very much towards a successful yes vote. Um, the importance can't be underestimated, not just to Yorta Yorta First Nations peoples around the country, but to the Australian people, to the future of Australian society and the way in which the integrity of Australia matures um, and um, embraces First Nations peoples. So tonight's a really important oration. This is the 15th Dungala Kiala oration and one of the most important conversations that we're going to have. Um, six weeks, there's a bit of a sprint to the finish, so to speak. Um, and we're looking not just to have the yes voters present, but we're trying to encourage those that might necessarily be undecided needing more information and, um, to be you know, turned into the yes. Um, so I want to say thanks to Uncle Cole and Dixie, and Dixie for creating the, oppor the opportunity here to open the, the proceedings. Um, we're in the hallowed halls of the Rumbelow Football Netball Club and the 13 teams that um, occupy these, these rooms the four football teams and the, the, the uh, nine netball teams. Um, they're here every week. They keep us reminding us of the work we have to do. We keep touch with their language that they, that they present, the culture that they have. Um, it's such a critical point of contact 
um, where we can get lost in the cultural world, if not for institutions like the Football Netball Club, the Rumbelara Aboriginal Cooperative, our aged care facilities, etc. Um, it's, um, I'm very proud to be able to stand up in these rooms. Um, I want to just say welcome to our um, to my co-host. Um, I just want to say that the, the, the Melbourne University and the Kaili Institute have been partnering, and the Rumbelara Football Netball Club have been partnering with the university for nearly 20 years. Um, it's starting to come to a, a, a fruition of engagement where we've worked really hard to inform the university of the needs of First Nations peoples, and it's taken a little bit of time, but we're getting there on how the university then sees itself working inside Aboriginal communities, or in particular the Goulburn Murray community. Um, I want to say thank, welcome also to, um, to Chancellor Jane Hanson and husband Paul Little. Um, welcome here tonight onto the, into the Football Netball Club rooms. Um, and again, to be witness to and be part of well, this, this, this journey that's, that's happening that is hopefully going to accumulate in a, in a, in a change in Australian society year in October. Um, um, just, if you just bear with me, I'm a little bit unsorted today. I've, I've had a bit of a challenge this afternoon. My wife's been taken to hospital, so I'm about to go and see if she's all right. Um, the oration when we started it 15 years ago, it was always about challenging the region, challenging this, the Yorta Yorta country, the people that, that lives on Yorta Yorta country, about defining the future, inspiring and encouraging this region here on Yorta Yorta country to be a leader in the acknowledgement and application of human rights, to continue to create a better, a more inclusive, more respectful region to change the economies, both social and emotional and financial economies of, of the First Nations people, the peoples that have been here for the 60,000 years. That is a measure of our community and our responsibility to ourselves and the nation to provide that, that sense of leadership. And is that not a worthwhile aspiration? Um, like the people and like our language, and Belinda, thank you, Belinda, um, spoke the language of the Yorta Yorta that went silent for quite some time. Language, the language um, revitalisation, the cultural revitalisation, cultural expression, cultural affirmation has been building over the last 20 years. We're now starting to hear Yorta Yorta language that reverberated up and down the waterways of this country for th many thousands of years, go dormant and now starting to find its way back. So, uh, we're looking forward to the, the future. Like the people and like our language, so many of our ceremonies have been abused, destroyed and remain unprotected since the invasion and dispossession of our ancestral lands. The referendum possibly in October, is the nation's chance, it's our chance, it's your chance to establish the constitution of this country as a foundational, foundational and guiding principle to recognise First Nations people as the core of Australian society, of the symbolisms of nationhood and a new world that we can aspire to. As a people, we are, as First Nations, as Yorta Yorta people, we are intrinsically unique in the world, and the recognition of First Nations people is of critical importance and so valuable to Australian society, so valuable to the, to the world and the future generations. Um, I've got to, uh, just a couple of quick slides that I just wanted to run by. Um, if, um, this just talks to 
what you've already heard about, and it just talks of the decline. That, that straight line across the top where we talk about well, closing the gap, um, that is prior, pre-invasion and post-invasion. Um, and the sorts of indicators that occurred that destroyed the quality of life of, of um, Yorta Yorta peoples in this country. Um, and I just want to make mention of those sorts of things that occurred, and people know them. But I think it was around about 1860 that um, my great-grandfather, who was a part of the Moira, Moira group, Moira men, that made deputation to King George for land, for sustenance. We, we ended up at a place called Kumaragunja that Uncle Cole spoke about, and Kumaragunja means my home. Um, it was not unlike a detention centre on our own country. Boundaries were put around it, fences were put around it, and the government managed it. Um, that is still emotionally where we're all connected to, and it holds the contemporary burial sites that, is, that has come with us um, since the establishment of places like Kamragunja and the role of Christianity in our lives. Um, but eight, maybe five kilometres away from there are the burial sites of, that have been around us for many, many, many thousands of years. Um, they're unseen. There's no crosses in that to describe them. Um, they're a part of the environment. Um, the footprint of our people is very soft. We're reconciling this transition in our lives. We're reconciling our history. We're, we're dealing with the challenges that of, the, of the present and we're looking to, do, to construct a future. It really depends, that construction of the future really depends on a successful yes vote. Um, here in, um, in Victoria, we're, we're you know, talking and working very hard now with, with, the, um, with, the, with the Daniel Andrews government on First Peoples Assembly and the push towards a, a treaty. Um, we haven't been waiting for that to occur. We've been working pretty hard on establishing a model that we think can actually give us those sorts of outcomes on a sustainable community only if, only if the region takes responsibility, the region takes ownership of the, that notion of closing the gap and is accountable, is held accountable. We can't do it off acts of benevolence and we can't do it off personal relationships. There has to be a stronger, more disciplined way to do that. The second, the second slide um, just talks to this. You can see number one, number two, number three. Number one is we put up a proposition. We, we spoke to, to um, Deloitte's Access Economics and said, well, what happens if we close the gap? What happens if Aboriginal people can live as long and share in the same quality of life as other peoples. And they said up the top, right up the very top, that it will increase regional productivity by $150 million per year. So how do we shift from a needs-based intervention strategy and, and model of, of engagement to an investment model? An investment in early childhood, investment in, in education, investment in role in jobs, but also an investment in cultural affirmation, cultural expression, where Aboriginal people feel valued and um, a part of the matrix of, of culture in the communities in which we live in. Um, that is currently not the case. Again, we need a successful yes vote to establish the principle of rights for Yorta Yorta and other First Nations peoples have an economy that underpins their sense of st stability and future and sustainability. The, we took the Deloitte's Access um, appraisal of the $150 million across our region 
and we work with KPMG to establish a regional prosperity plan. That's been put into place now two years ago. So it was two years in July that we launched here in these rooms the regional prosperity plan. Um, there's been inactive active engagement from government in relation to it. We haven't stopped. We've talked now about well, what does a regional investment model look like to achieve that, that productivity dividend, dividend and the investment in language, the investment in cultural, cultural um, relationships, cultural affirmation and expression are critical cornerstones, benchmarks for Aboriginal people to feel confident to enter into the economies and into the social engagement with the broader society. We have to feel the love, you know. We have to feel that integrated approach, but the respect and value that we're not just a dependency body of people on taxpayer funds, we have a right as First Nations peoples to an economy. We're working at the moment on what an investment model might look like and how we establish a regional investment fund that en enables us to place those scholarships into early childhood, into, into primary schools, into secondary schools, into professional workforce development, into higher education, where we have the capacity to control that. At the moment, we don't have any capacity to do that. What we have to do at the moment is to travel to Spring Street or travel to Canberra to try and ask for resources to deliver. And in the main, the resources are to deliver crisis intervention that should be delivered on a human rights measurement anyway. But that becomes a, a, a bucket of funds that sit, sits isolated and siloed for Aboriginal people. My, my thinking is that we have as much a right to say about the future of Australian society as we do about the future of Aboriginal people. Everything is impacting on us, not just, not just the interventions. So that, that thinking then is um, what's guiding us, but it really does depend on whether or not there's a successful, um, a su successful yes vote to, um, to, to give us the foundational platform to work with the region. Otherwise, we are still working off relationships and acts of benevolence that we may be able to develop. Um, the, next, the next slide is how I see you know, the notion of, of, the, of, the, um, of the referendum and having a voice, having a, a voice to parliament is, as a region, we need to be able to talk to Canberra. As a region, we need to be able to talk with with Spring Street here in Victoria, in Melbourne, but we need a regional in the centre. We, regional, we need that regional negotiations table that allows us to, to develop a, an investment model that industry, universities, local government entities that we all collaborate on. And how we, we need, in that model, we need the, the notion of um, uh, Data, data sovereignty to help us measure the things that we think are important, that we want to measure, and how we hold our region to account. But in that model, it also is regional stimulation for investment into the region and into the regional priorities. Aboriginal kids, your Yorta kids, have to be able to find a way to aspire to the, what the regional priorities are. It's that that will take them to the universities and take them into the workforce and into career paths. Um, we can't sit independent, we can't sit isolated. We have to find a way to stimulate that thinking about if agriculture, if renewables, if climate, climate change, if those are the, if they're the priorities, they're our priorities. And if we invest in them, we're investing because we've got a model that builds our sustainability as a people. It builds your order sustainability, it builds the sustainability of our region and we become part of a cyclical economy. At the moment we sit measuring the deficits. If it's family violence, if it's drug and alcohol, if it's justice, etc. They're the things that are driving the economy that's wrapped around 
Aboriginal people at present. So this is a mind shift and it's a, it's a challenge for governments to, to shift in their thinking and it's the way in which we put seatbelt laws, for argument's sake, on our region to behave in a different manner. That as Yorta Yorta people we have a right to an economy that, was, that is commensurate with what we had prior to the loss of our lands. And we do still sit on our lands and we do still do welcome to countries but the regional GDP doesn't recognise us. But it needs to. It needs to reinvest in the people. And then we'll grow to that 150 million productivity dividend that Deloitte talks about. Um, so tonight, when we deliberately ask for um, the issue of the voice and to ask Professor Davis to come and talk, um, it's to, you know, to bring some some weight to this conversation in our region where we've been very well much divided on the place of Yorta Yorta. Um, but it's an integrated, it's an integrated um, interdependency that we have to create, but we can only do it when we've got the sustainability of Yorta Yorta identity strong and in a strong place where kids are aspirational about education and, and acquisition of knowledge. We're also talking about Indigenous knowledge and the imparting of Indigenous knowledge back into the mainstream. So curriculum design is going to be a very critical part of the future design process. Um, having said that, I'm really proud that, and pleased and privileged that you know, Megan has been able to come here tonight. We're in, we're in a football netball rooms in Shepparton, could be anywhere in the country but it's here tonight and we're talking about the health of the Goulburn Murray region, Yorta Yorta country, the seat of Nichols. And we know we haven't got a strong federal leader at the moment in the seat of Nichols, but we're looking forward to the future. And we think we can create that future if that's a successful, if that's a successful yes vote. Um, so I'd just like to say thanks everyone for coming along today and tonight and um, being part of this and to the live stream that's going out to everybody that across the nation that um, you know, your, your people and the city of Shepparton, as I know, is voting yes. Um, you know, we're, we're, all in, we're all in this. So, thank you. Enviable task of following that tour de force from, from Uncle Paul. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Uncle Dixie Patton uh, and thank uh, Uncle Cole for his uh, fine words and uh, particularly uh, Belinda for her fantastic speech, really beautiful. And of course, uh, Uncle Paul for that, as I say, tour de force. It's really great to be in Shepparton again. I always love coming here and once more in these. Uh, historic, I'd say, Rumbalara Football Netball Club rooms. I uh, begin by acknowledging the elders of the Yorta Yorta people and the elders of all the indigenous peoples of Australia who have collectively cared for the lands and waterways of this vast continent for many, many tens of thousands of years. I pay my deep respects to elders past and present and I acknowledge all indigenous people present or viewing this event. I will particularly acknowledge Paul Briggs and everyone here at the Kaila Institute. Uh, Paul I wish um, more of our leaders and politicians would listen to Paul and people like him. He's a good man. He's a great leader. Uh, he's always incredibly welcoming whenever we're here on Yorta Yorta country. And I've learned a huge amount from him over my years in Australia. Paul has made a unique contribution to the University of Melbourne over many years. Uh, in 2005, I remind people, he became the first Indigenous man to be a member of the University Council, which is, of course, our top governance body. And he's made an extraordinary contribution through Rumbalara in the Ash Partnership for the past 19 years, and of course the Dungala Kaila, Dungala Kaila oration uh, for the for the last 15 years. Paul is a great leader who is inspiring a new generation of leaders here in Shepton, including a number of people who are in the room uh, tonight. And, and I want to recall my gratitude for Paul's long-standing and continuing leadership. Um, one of those. Uh, 
emerging leaders is, is Raylene, who introduced us tonight, and I'm uh, proud to call her uh, one of our recent PhD graduates. And I'm proud to call her a colleague now at the university because she's doing a postdoc uh, with us, which is great. Um, I, I'm also delighted to welcome as co-host here Professor Megan Davis, the Dungala Kaela Orator for 2023. We're incredibly delighted uh, that you've been able to travel to be with us tonight, Megan. I know you're incredibly busy, but this is an important event and uh, uh, it's a very important time in the life of the nation. This oration, historically, is about giving Indigenous people a voice, particularly here in the Golden Valley region, although I also think that the importance of the messages spoken here, year by year, certainly go out well beyond the Golden Valley to the whole of Australia and, indeed, uh, to other countries beyond Australia. Not all the speakers who have given this oration have been Indigenous, though many are, but every single orator who has ever spoken here has understood and emphasised the importance of empowering the Indigenous voice, Indigenous self-determination, Indigenous culture as something vital and permanent in the life of this country. I think that the great work that, that you, Professor Davis, and Pat Anderson and many others have done in advancing the Uluru Statement from the Heart through to where we are now, on the cusp of a national referendum uh, to enshrine a voice in the Constitution of Australia, is very much in sync with the work that Paul and uh, Kayla and Indigenous communities around Australia uh, have been doing for many years now. The voice to Parliament, in my view, is not a huge ask on the nation. It is an important mechanism for hearing from Indigenous people themselves in a public forum and with the ear of government about matters of importance to Aboriginal people. I don't think that's too much to ask for. Uh, it seems very straightforward to me. It, the voice should be enshrined in the Constitution of Australia, but we know that it is not automatic that it will happen. Accordingly, speaking tonight as the leader of one of the country's most significant cultural and educational institutions uh, and the second oldest university in the country after Sydney, it is clear that we also at the University of Melbourne must be present in the public discussion that leads into the referendum vote. Big universities, uh, as we probably all realise, are pretty unruly places and very hard to unite and make agree on many things. But I'm pleased, and it is significant, I think, that all the leadership groups at the University of Melbourne have come together firmly behind the voice. The university's executive committee, uh, the University of Melbourne's governing council, with the great support and leadership of the Chancellor, Jane Hanson, and its main academic body, the academic board, have all come out publicly in favour of a yes vote, and we did that pretty early on in the process. Uh, we've all adopted to make this a public indication of our leadership support because we believe this to be a matter of public principle. It, it, it should not be cast in terms of party politics. It's disgraceful to do so, in my opinion, but it should be seen as a vote on a moral uh, and, and civic principle. It's about human rights. It's not about politics. The fact that we uh, have made public our views in the University of Melbourne is because, directly because of the influence of our guest speaker, Professor Davis. My experience of hearing, hearing her speak at the University's Australia conference in March this year really struck home with me. I'll quote something of what you said, Megan, on that occasion at the university's conference. She said, I don't really stomach that we, the universities, are mere facilitators of debate. Universities say they don't want to be political, but the decision not to take a stance for Uluru and for the voice of Parliament is a political decision. Silence is political. I came straight back home from that conference uh, with those words ringing in my ears, and straight away I started to speak with my colleagues at the university about how we can make a public statement or statements on the voice. It's never straightforward to get everyone agreeing on anything at a university, as I've said, but we made considerable efforts, we talked it through, and in the end I was uh, glad that uh, we could get clear support uh, for the voice that we publicly stated. This is also very personal for me. Uh, my wife, Sarah, and I uh, have been in the country for five years, and we recently became Australian citizens just last month. This will be the first matter that we vote on in Australia. And I'm very pleased and proud of the fact that the voice will be the first thing that I will vote on because it is such an important historic moment for this country. For me, and, 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 and here I'm going to go slightly beyond what some people think I probably should do, but it's a personal view. Uh, the fact is that we have to give Indigenous people a voice to Parliament because throughout the history of this nation, in the past 250 years or so, Indigenous people have been appallingly treated. Uh, also, the Constitution of Australia still has problems with it. I, I, I'm not a constitutional expert like Professor Davis, but I do not think that most constitutions in the world 
have references to race, as ours still does. Uh, yes, 1967 was a big step forward by removing an egregiously racist component of the original Constitution. And let's remember what that original part, which was removed in 1967, stated. It said that in reckoning the numbers of the people of the Commonwealth or of a state or other part of the Commonwealth, Aboriginal natives shall not be counted. It was a wise and moral thing for Australians to remove that clearly racist and unjustified component of the Constitution, as they did in 1967. Now there's another decisive step to be taken. In the words of the Uluru Statement, and, and, that, and that is not just to count Indigenous people, but to hear what they've got to say, and, and moreover, listen to what they're saying and act accordingly. It's an honour to join with Paul in welcoming you, Megan, to speak with us at the Dunga Kaila oration tonight. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Uncle Paul, for highlighting and acknowledging um, it's a principle of the place of First Nations people and the future of our society. This vote will reflect integrity of Australian society and the way in which we mature as a nation. For acknowledging the partnership between the University of Melbourne and the Yorta Yorta community is beginning to mature and that this oration challenges the region about how they think about the future to be more inclusive and respectful to change the economies, to create leadership, to demonstrate to the nation the potential of finding our languages. And Professor Duncan Maskell, for bringing to our attention the strong leadership. Congratulations on becoming an Australian citizen. And we're all super excited that you get to vote. Your first vote will be for the Australian Aboriginal people to have a voice in the Australian constitution. This community, this club and this room in particular has been the beginning of many inspiring activities, none more than the Dungala Children's Choir. The choir was established by Yorta Yorta soprano, educator, actor, composer and playwright Professor Deborah Cheatham Freyon AO. Their award-winning and moving performances keep the traditional song lines alive, sharing culture, singing in traditional language and telling stories. The choir has performed with AB Original and Paul Kelly at the Arias and were featured on Archie Roach's album, Let Love Rule. It's the intention of the Dungala Choir to take their show onto the international stage. Please welcome Professor Deborah Cheatham and the Dungala Children's Choir. Thank you so much. I needed to be home. <laughs> Standing here I am. Not only that, I'm with family. And the strength that I draw today from this, the country of my grandmother and my ancestors is considerable. Professor Davis, I'm looking forward to this so much. It's the injection of hope that we need right now is coming together. It's the confidence that our nation has lacked for so long. That's what the yes vote can give as well. Uncle Paul, these hallowed football netball club rooms have also been home, as you know, to Dungala Children's Choir. We've been so grateful for that home. It remains our home. And the strength that we draw as a choir and the confidence that these children show each year at the Dungala Kaila Oration is gained by being here, drawing on the strength of their ancestors. So thank you for welcoming us back year after year as family. 
I am so proud that the university that I spent the first 12 years of my 16 years in Victoria, devoting whatever I could of my skill set to, has come out as yes. To remain silent is a political statement. I'm at another university at the moment and they have not taken that step. But as the Chair of Vocal Studies at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, my alma mater, I'm driving along with my colleagues that our school will say yes in spite of the decision of the university. The School of Health, the Law School have already come out in support. And so as a grass unit, a grassroots movement. Each of the schools at the University of Sydney will speak up. If this is how we have to do it, then so be it. I remain resolute, even when my confidence wavers. Why? Where does my resolution come from? The voices that you are about to hear. I've said it before, it's worth saying again. They are reason to get up in the morning, Dungana Children's Choir. There are reasons for me to fly home from Rome last night and get on a plane this morning, eventually, thanks Qantas, to <laughs> arrive here to be with this group today. <laughs> They're the reason. I have privilege to travel. And it's one that I want to share with Dungala Children's Choir. Later this year, they'll travel to, to Nam, where in Hamer Hall, they will perform Yumarala War Requiem for Peace, along with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and the Melbourne uh, Chorus, Consort of Melbourne. They are an integral part of the bringing of confidence to our community. And we're honoured this evening to sing two songs in the language of this place, in the language of Yorta Yorta, in my grandmother's language, in my language. Thanks firstly to Auntie Jerry Briggs, who made sure the translation of a song that's well known on this country, Bura Thera. And then to Belinda Briggs, I reject that you can't tell a story. It's more than a story, it's knowledge and truth that you convey, it's powerful. You know the strength that I draw on it every year. Your humility and the way that you lead so gently, Belinda, is an inspiration to everyone here. So thank you for your words. Thank you for the words in the second song we'll sing, Biramamana. Yinya wamaraman bayala ganya gukalga gongai dangamai biramamana. The light upon the river red gum in the sunset is so beautiful. The magpie and the crow are returning home to the nest.
Thank you to Deborah Cheatham Freyon and the Dungala Children's Choir. It's always a beautiful way to start the evening with the incredible and talented voices of the choir. If you want more, they have upcoming performances this year, including the 14th of October uh, at the Hammer Hall Arts Centre in Melbourne and also the 14th of November at the M Pavilion opening Melbourne. These details are also in the oration program. It's my great honour now to welcome Professor Megan Davis, the Pro Vice Chancellor Society at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Professor Davis is also the Chair of Constitutional Law, a UNSW Scientist Professor, a Professor of Law and Director of the Indigenous Law Centre at UNSW Law. She is a Cobble Cobble woman from Barragum. Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> um, nation and a renowned constitutional lawyer and public law expert focusing on advocacy for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Her work extends internationally through roles at the United Nation, focusing on global Indigenous rights. In this capacity, she was elected by the UN Human Rights Council to the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples based in Geneva in 2017 and again in 2019 to 2022 and served pre previously as an expert member and chair of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, UN headquarters in New York from 2011 to 2016. She is currently the chair of the expert mechanism. Professor Davies is an acting commissioner of the New South Wales Land and Environmental Court Environment Court, sorry, a Fellow of the Australian Academ Ac Academy of Law and a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences. She is also a member of the Australian Rugby League Commissioner, perhaps her most important title. <laughs> Please welcome Professor Megan Davies. played rugby and I'm on the board of the Australian Rugby League Commission so it's um, always been um, uh, never quite um, understood AFL um, but, it, but I, I do know about this football club um, and the important role of AFL um, in communities down here. I feel really emotional after that choir. I was trying not to cry and then I'm like Look, look through the clouds, look through the w window, and then I looked up and saw Nikki Winmar, and then I'm just like, <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm so I'm a little bit. Um, that that was just extraordinary, um, and it's always so beautiful to hear um, those beautiful bird-like sounds of our our jarjams and Professor Cheatham. I can't see anyone from up here, so thank you for that incredible moment. It's such an honour to be here. Um, on Yorta Yorta Country um, to deliver this oration tonight. Um, and so I thank you, especially you, Paul, for chasing me and chasing me and chasing me. It's a very busy, busy time at the moment, of course, um, uh, with the referendum. And um, so I'd like to acknowledge you, Paul, and our many, many interactions over the years since the dialogues and since then in terms of this very lengthy struggle battle to get to a referendum where we are now. Thank you to Duncan and um, Linda that was just extraordinary and I'll return to um, that a bit later. I also just wanted to quickly acknowledge um, Eddie Sinnott, one of the constitutional lawyers I work with, he's a Wemba Wemba man, I don't know where you've gone over there. Um, he's in the audience too and probably cried as well. It's, um, it's a tough time for the team because there's a lot of racism and hate and um, being directed to people actively involved in the campaign and it's, it's difficult for people. But that's offset by the extraordinary support of the Australian people um, and especially our mob. And in this room tonight, I really feel nothing but love um, and care. And so it's nice to be here to talk about this extraordinary journey we have been on and, and the next eight weeks. So I deliver this oration a week from the announcement of a referendum 
date uh, to acknowledge uh, or recognise First Nations peoples in Australia's constitution. And many people in the room um, have been involved in the lengthy march for the recognition of First Nations peoples' rights. And Aunty Pat Anderson does send her love this week. Today she's um, at the Hands on Heart, the Uluru Dialogue Youth are running a youth conference. It's an intercultural conference where we've invited 100 Australian youth and, and together they're going to, to lead um, our youth and in particular our Gen Z on this journey towards um, the referendum. But she'll be here tomorrow, well she's going to Geelong tomorrow, so we missed her by one night. This constitutional recognition process grew out of a decades long multi-party support for constitutional recognition uh, in the Australian constitution. Some people take as the starting point of this referendum the 1999 Republic, where there was a singular uh, sentence of recognition in the preamble that John Howard put to the Australian people um, that failed. Some say it was 2007 in the lead up to the federal election where Howard announced that within his first 100 days he would move to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, within a new preamble to the Australian Constitution. The formal process of constitutional recognition, though, that has got us to here today and eight weeks out of a referendum on a voice to parliament began in 2011 with the Gillard Labor government and continued until 2022, when the new incoming Prime Minister, Albanese, committed to a referendum uh, on The Voice. So this is the 12th year of constitutional recognition in Australia. The 12th year. That is well over a decade of work conducted in plain sight, meaning everything was public, everything was published and with extensive public consultation among the Australian community and First Nations communities to understand what does meaningful constitutional recognition look like. So in that decade, uh, the constitutional recognition decade, we have had seven processes, seven formal processes, started with the expert panel, ended with the referendum council, um, and then the Lisa Dodson parliamentary inquiry that looked into the referendum council's work. But seven processes and 10 reports in a decade. That's a lot on anything in Australia. This is a major national nation building endeavor. And the last significant deliberative process in that journey to now was the referendum council's work on the First Nations Regional Dialogues, who settled on a voice to Parliament as the most meaningful form of constitutional recognition. So recognition is not what its dictionary meaning says it is, acknowledgement. Recognition is a voice. The referendum is about recognition through a voice. It's the recognition of us as First Peoples, as Paul alluded to at the outset, but it's a recognition of us through our voice, recognising the important role that our voice should play in Australian democracy. So it's both symbolic and substantive recognition. Much has been written of late about and spoken about in terms of what the voice means to Australians and what it will bring to this country. Much of that has been fact-based. A lot of it, regrettably, is based on misinformation and lies. So tonight, I'm going to speak about the future of the voice and what the voice can achieve. But I want to talk about that in the context of the campaign first. So I'll begin by making some reflections on the campaign because I think it's important to set these down. And then I will speak to The Voice in a practical sense in terms of how it sits here in Australia, Australian democracy, 
but viewed within an international legal framework in a democratic country. The future of the voice is not solely anchored in closing the gap, but also anchored in culture and the substantive and concrete rights we exercise as First Nations peoples. The future of the voice is about Australian democracy and our rightful place in it. We can be cynical and mistrustful of government, but our people have always been pragmatic people who take advantage of opportunities that are put before us on the table to progress and advance our position, particularly our voice. Since the very early colonial periods, our people have identified the need to have input into the laws and the policies that are passed about our communities. And yes, we aspire to many other structural reforms and I acknowledge the work and the progress of the Victorian Treaty process. This lecture though is focused and limited to the federal process and, and the referendum. An Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to parliament, which is enshrined in the constitution, is about a more effective and efficient participation of our peoples in the democratic life of the state. A voice that enhances Australian democracy. It's positive for all Australians. It's positive for our people. So I begin with some reflections on the campaign because of unfortunately the way in which the voice is being portrayed in some parts of public deba uh, debate does not uh, result in the enhancement of Australian democracy. It is troubling that there have been claims, quite outlandish claims, that the voice as a structure and as a function is undemocratic or that it will lead to dysfunction and perverse outcomes that it will lead, as uh, the opposition leader has said, to the destruction of Australian democracy. Some claims you may have heard include that the voice amounts to a third or specific chamber or special chamber of parliament with special access and rights of consideration and input over all laws. Another claim that is in the no pamphlet states or provides that the voice uh, specifically covers all areas of executive government. This means that no issue is beyond its reach. And the pamphlet suggests that the High Court would ultimately determine its powers, not the, uh, not the Parliament. And so it risks legal challenges and delays in dysfunctional government. Another claim is that the voice could veto a future referendum seeking to remove it from the Constitution. The facts do not support these claims and it's disappointing that the pamphlet as printed by the Australian Electoral Commission was not fact-checked and that as previous referendums that have occurred, the Australian Electoral Commission stamp does go on a pamphlet that is not fact-checked. So let me talk about the first claim which, it, which is that the voice uh, amounts to a third or a special chamber of parliament. Uh, with special access and rights of consideration and input over all laws. The voice plainly does not create a third chamber of parliament. It sits outside the parliament. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that when we ran the dialogues, our mobs who turned up to the 13 dialogues didn't put their hand up and say, hey, I want to be a politician. Hey, I want to join a political party and... I want to devote my life to political ideology. That's not what people said. They didn't want to be politicians. Most of the people who participated in the dialogues live in communities in the service of their people. That is what they devote their lives to. They do not belong to ideological political parties. They spoke of a voice to the parliament. They didn't call for reserve seats or designated parliamentary seats. The voice does not have the powers or the responsibilities of the House of Representatives or the Senate. The language of the proposed section 129, which will be inserted into the Australian Constitution, distinguishes the voice as a body that
that may make representations to the parliament and to the executive. It is the parliament that has the power to make laws about the voice. Parliament is able to design, decide its uh, composition, functions, powers and procedures. This claim is entirely inconsistent with the voice itself. The suggestion that it is a chamber is a misreading of the proposed section at best and deliberate scaremongering at worst. These claims attempt to suggest that the voice is a radical change that should be feared. This is not the case. The voice will be an advisory constitutional entity that can efficiently represent directly to the parliament and the government. It is not a part of the parliament at all. It does not introduce bills into parliament nor vote on legislation. The parliament retains full control over its own procedures. If you read parts of Facebook, you would not think that that was the case. The proposed amendment also provides that the voice may make representations on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This will not involve representations on all policies formulated by government or bills proposed to Parliament, regardless of the subject matter of those laws and policies. That would be impractical, unnecessary, unnecessary and overly burdensome on voice representatives. In fact, the reality of the voice is that its success will rise and fall on the judicious decisions that our people make about the representations they choose to make. Another claim is, that has is been published in the No pamphlet is in relation to the voice and the issues that it can comment on in relation to the executive power. This wording is also relevant to the No pamphlet's claims about there being no issue be, beyond the voice's reach. The voice is limited to making representations on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This means it cannot make representations on all areas of government. It will be able to have a say on matters that relate directly to mob and to issues that are relevant um, to all Australians, but which actually affect mob differently. The voice should rightly be able to decide what affects mob and what does not. And this is consistent with international human rights law. The right to self-determination of Indigenous peoples and the right to participate in decision-making which would affect rights creates an expectation that the voice would be able to determine where its attentions and resources are best directed. The notion that it will create vast numbers of legal challenges and delays in lawmaking is overblown. And as uh, Brett Walker, uh, senior counsel, said in his evidence to the parliamentary inquiry on the provision, he, he is the barrister that has the most busiest practice in constitutional law before the High Court of Australia now. He said the idea that it will lead to excessive litigation and matters tied up in the High Court for decades, he said, it's just too silly for words. Also, the idea that the voice could veto a future referendum seeking to remove it from the Constitution. Again, the voice has no power to veto anything. The Australian Constitution sets up the Parliament as being supreme. Um, this um, cannot be subverted by the voice. It is ironic that this disinformation and misinformation as it relates to our electoral processes generally and the voice referendum specifically is itself a threat to our democracy. It is a blight on the integrity of our elections. Some of the claims are outright lies. Some of them are statements that misinform, ignore nuance and aim to create confusion. Some of them have the veneer of legitimacy and are made by those who know better. The free flow of this type of information, even where ultimately corrected, leads to confusion in the voting public. That confusion is then leveraged in the no campaigns, don't know, vote no campaign. 
and we put out a press release last year because the No campaign hit 50, half a century, and the number of fact checks in which they've been found to be incorrect. The Australian Electoral Commission has a disinformation register, but it relates only to allegations about the integrity of the referendum process itself. The AEC explicitly does not seek to censor or fact check the debate in any way. And despite the excellent fact checking efforts of several reputable organisations, including RMIT, many of them remain in the public discourse in the public domain and they appear to be doing damage. And can I say, what would this country do if it wasn't for those independent fact checkers? Because what we're finding is mainstream media is a passive conduit of misinformation and disinformation and no one is checking except for these external entities and that shouldn't be the way in which uh, this debate runs in this country. Hours and hours have been spent on debunking these claims with valuable resources being diverted to the task of investigating and responding to media queries. Despite the prolific nature of the false claims and the efforts made to debunk them, they continue to be published, shared and amplified. We cannot address this disinformation alone. We as a campaign call on individual journalists and media and social media outlets to cease facilitating misinformation and disinformation on The Voice. Spreading disinformation is a key plank in the No campaign's effort to defeat this referendum. We call on the Australian media to do better in refusing to publish it, or at the very least, fact check it. So, what is the truth of The Voice? And why is it such an important plank in making progress on our priorities? Up until very recently, and I think Paul has very eloquently referred to this, the conversation in the country has been dominated by closing the gap. These are the government initiatives that aim to reduce disadvantage and accelerate improvements in the lives of our people. We had closing the gap iteration one, which everyone agreed did not work, and we are now in the midst of closing the gap iteration two. This iteration began in a national agreement on closing the gap in 2020. Closing the gap sets up a framework in which Indigenous Australians or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are in a deficit and spoken about in a deficit. Um, and the state applies its resources as a means to address the imbalance between the experiences and outcomes of our people and the experiences and outcomes of non-Indigenous Australians. The fact is, however, and I think most people agree on that, on this, is that progress on closing the gap is languishing. The Productivity Commission's first review on progress of the agreement shows that government is not adequately delivering on its commitment to overcome the entrenched inequality faced by too many of our people. In addition to the lack of progress, closing the gap is a needs-based response. It's not the lasting structural reform which has been called for by our people in the dialogues and at Uluru. The Voice addresses that need for structural change. The change proposed by the establishment of The Voice in the Constitution is change to the structure of Australia's public institutions. A Voice would redistribute public power in a minor way, because it is a modest provision, via the Constitution, the highest law in the country. A voice will create an institutional relationship which will compel the government to listen to the views of our people when setting policy and making decisions that affect our lives. The voice will give mob a seat at the table. And the voice is about a cultural shift, a cultural change. People often say, well, you know, you can't be running around the halls of parliament with the bells ringing. That's not how the voice is going to have an impact. We don't see the voice as having an impact in that way. The constitutional provision enables us to make representations, 
and be at the table when laws and policies are made about our lives and our communities. That creates cultural change. It means that bureaucrats and parliaments and governments will consult our people earlier or at the very first opportunity that they think of an idea or they think of a proposal. As Paul would know only too well and many of you in this room, the, the policies that are imposed on our communities are often thought bubbles that bureaucrats, politicians come up with and often they fail because there is no substance behind them. Westminster uh, parliamentarianism and our legal and political system is dependent on a concept of legitimacy and legitimacy only flows from having the people who are impacted at the table when those laws and policies are made. The proposed insertion of a new section into the Constitution provides two things, the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first peoples of Australia. And secondly, it creates a practical mechanism for the views of communities to be made to the structures of power. And that is achieved through the embodiment of the voice. Why does it matter that it's in the Constitution? It matters for durability, for sustainability. And I'll repeat this on a number of occasions, but Paul referred to the capacity of our communities to plan. We don't get to plan for the future. It matters because constitutions can create the material conditions for a dignified human life. Constitutions can provide the fundamental resources and material conditions that humans need to live and thrive and to live a flourishing life and for Indigenous self-determination. And by and large, that has been the case for most Australians. And the VC said from the outset, or, or mentioned at the outset, two provisions that excluded our people from the constitutional order from the very beginning, through the drafting of the constitution in the 1890s and then the constitution that came into being in 1901, we were expressly excluded. 67 was a correction in that the deletion or the, the express exclusion of us from the work of the federal parliament was deleted so that the federal parliament could make laws in relation to us. But it was a neutral zone that it put us in. It hasn't empowered us. It didn't empower our people. The Australian constitution is hard to change and because of that, it provides consistency and, to a large degree, certainty. Unlike government policy, it cannot be changed with the stroke of a pen. So the really fundamental issue to keep in mind when we go to vote in eight weeks is that the Australian Constitution contains principle. It doesn't contain bricks and mortar. It doesn't contain meat on the bones. It contains principle. So we vote on the principle. We vote on the principle that our people or the Australian people endorse, that our people should have a voice on laws and policies that are made about their lives. That's the principle. And if Australians agree to that principle, then we walk through the door and on the other side is the parliament. And it's their job to make the legislation that designs the voice. When the Australian people were asked, and it, wasn't all Australian people, of course. Um, it wasn't uh, women and it wasn't men with no property. But when the Australian Constitution came into being in 1901, it recognised the High Court of Australia. But it didn't pass legislation. There's nothing contained in the Constitution that sets up the High Court of Australia. It was passed in legislation several years later. It's a really important point to keep in mind about our agency as Australians. We are exercising our agency as the people who the draft is designated should change the constitution to insert this principle. The principle that 
we are the first peoples of Australia and that we as a nation recognise that and the principle that there should be a practical mechanism set up so that we can give our views to the parliament and to the executive. Because that's what the provision does. It permits us constitutionally to venture an opinion. That's what the voice is. It constitutionally allows us to venture an opinion about the laws and policies that are being made about our lives. Often in focusing solely on closing the gap and in addressing disadvantage and inequality, this area of Indigenous policy can become an exercise in playing catch-up. And in that, uh, Indigenous people's rights or concrete rights get lost. Indigenous rights involve two broad aspects. The first is measures that are required to address Indigenous disadvantage, which is key to closing the gap. Those types of laws and policies are temporary. They're set up as temporary by the law because when people get to the same level of equality and advantage as other Australians, those opportunities are intended to fall away. But as Paul alluded to very early on, Indigenous peoples also have a substantive right that flows from our cultural distinctiveness and these rights are permanent. And Australia has recognised that in a number of ways from statutory land rights to, to native title to cultural heritage and many other kinds of recognition of those rights. This distinction between special rights and substantive rights is set up in the Racial Discrimination Act. It's a Commonwealth Act which enacts into Australia law, Australian law the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. The Convention provides that it is not racial discrimination to take special measures for the sole purpose of securing the advancement of groups or individuals requiring such protection to ensure that they have equal enjoyment or exercise of their human rights. Such measures are required to be temporary, as I said, they are lawfully able to exist until their objectives are achieved. This legislation makes plain the ability of the state to create special temporary measures for the purpose of securing advancement. But there is also another set of rights that I think Paul, and we didn't get the opportunity to talk before the oration, but has touched upon that is really important in the discussion for our people about the voice, and that is those substantive rights that we... Um, have and that the state is obliged to, to recognise um, as a consequence of being First Nations, of that cultural distinctiveness of being First Nations. And this is important because it means the voice can make representations to the parliament and to the executive on those matters. And I think Belinda alluded to one and, and so did Paul when they spoke about language rights. Lang language rights and language revitalisation are a key part of that which sustains us as First Nations peoples. So the voice won't relate solely to a deficit in our experiences in contemporary life. Representations which come under this substantive, ri uh, sorry, substantive right can relate to the recognition of Indigenous cultures and Indigenous languages and our tangible heritage and the many issues I think that Paul uh, ventilated in relation to future planning and cultural economies um, and regional economies. What's important here is that matters relating to us as, as a peoples or multiple nations will be matters that are connected to us because of our cultural distinctiveness, because of our community. And we have a common law and a legal system that readily recognises that. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is another instrument which is relevant to this conversation. 
because the declaration seeks to restore relationships between Indigenous peoples and the state. The declaration recognises uh, that the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples derive from their political and economic and social structures and from their cultures and spiritual traditions, their histories and philosophies, especially their rights to land and territories and resources. And there's three specific provisions in the Declaration which are important to this and important to the voice. One is the UN Declaration, oh, sorry, one is Article 3 of the Declaration, which speaks about self-determination and the capacity of our people to freely determine their political status and their economic, social and cultural development. And there's many communities who say they cannot do that because of the way in which Indigenous Affairs is run uh, from Canberra and the way in which funding and resource allocation occurs by people who sit outside of communities. Fundamental to the voice is Article 18 and 19, which was spoken a lot about in the dialogues and since. Because the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it does say that the right to self-determination is a right that is exercised under the liberal democratic framework of the state. And Article 18 in particular states that Indigenous peoples have their, uh, a right to participate in decision-making, which would affect their rights through represented representatives chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures, as well, to, as well as to maintain and develop their own Indigenous decision-making institutions. Article 18 is a really critical article here because that is precisely what The Voice is about. It's about the right of our people to participate in decision-making that is made about their lives in our liberal democracy and that that should be done through representatives who we choose to represent us. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was endorsed by the Australian Government in 2009 and it has tremendous influence as a consensus opinion of the United Nations General Assembly. And like all declarations, it may be used to interpret statutory ambivalence or statutory ambiguity, but it is not um, like a convention. It has not yet been passed in domestic law. It is not the subject of an act. Even so, the voice gives life to these international legal standards. The voice fits squarely within these international norms and domestic law in a mature and flourishing democracy. It fits squarely within a modern Australia that seeks to grapple with the truth of its past but not let the past be a burden on the future. The voice allows us to look forward to a future where we can plan and allocate resources to the, fut to the future knowing that the disruption and the uprooting of one government to the next in communities is behind us. As Arnie Pat says, every time there's a change of government, we have to troop to Canberra and we have to justify who we are. We have to justify our humanity and explain what the funding is for and take a map and circle on the map to the new minister or the new bureau bureaucrats who we are. Imagine being able to plan for your community for the future beyond the three year cycle or the cycle of a particular government. This town and this region will be like all others in that the government has committed to a design phase to follow the referendum if successful. And this will enable our people on the ground to contribute to the model. This is critical to legitimacy, as I mentioned from the outset, and the success of the voice as an institution. That design involves discussion of how our members will be selected by the community. In all of the Uluru dialogues, most people sought a democratically elected ballot box election and discussions about a voice. This will enable every First Nations person of voting age to decide who represents them. But that is up to that design phase. It's not up to me. They also spoke about accountability in the same way that Paul has spoken about tonight. It was one of the biggest issues discussed in the dialogues, and that is the accountability of people 
who represent them in Canberra and at a state government le level, but never return to community to explain what they're doing. That two-way accountability was really acute in the dialogues. In fact, people spoke about things like a recall mechanism. A recall mechanism is something that is in some liberal democracies in the world and some American states where if you don't like the way in which your local representative is representing you, or they're not coming back from Canberra and telling you what's in the budget or what are you spending that money on, then you can get a threshold of signatures and initiate a new election and kick that member out and vote someone else in. There were all sorts of incredible ideas given by the men and women in the dialogues as to how the voice might operate. The voice is not designed to uproot or subjugate or supplant already existing organisations. It's not the role of the voice to do program and service delivery. We have organisations that do that for us. The voice is about advocacy. It's about giving voice to our people's issues in a way that will improve the design and deliberations of law and policy so that they are of a better quality and so we get better quality outcomes because the parliament and the executive will have engaged in a deep and meaningful way, not in the superficial way that they currently do. For communities in regional and remote areas, it's not easy to have your views well known and ventilated via the service sector because that's not the role of those organisations despite their DNA as community control. We also know that the service sector has always stood alongside the advocacy arm of the organisations that have been set up to represent our people whether it be ATSIC or whether it be the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. But since ATSIC and since the abolition of the Congress, there has been no discernible voice. Rather, we see politicians of all stripes and media speak to Indigenous uh, uh, individuals or they use anecdotes and second-hand and third-hand stories about this Indigenous leader said this or this Indigenous community said this without anyone ever checking whether that's true and without any regard for authority or cultural authority. Australians can be assured that when the voice speaks to Parliament or the bureaucracy that there is a weight of authority and especially cultural authority behind it. And that is important to the change that is needed on the ground. The opposition says that a voice isn't needed and that there are plenty of voices. But we know under the LNP that the only voices that were heard were insiders or those with connections to their parties and those who are reliant on that particular government of the day for funding. We know there's no authoritative voice now. We know this because the men and women of the First Nations regional dialogues told us in the most comprehensive constitutional deliberative process. It's why the voice to parliament is the prominent reform. And I note again that Paul spoke of us having to rely on who you know and acts of benevolence. And I think to my own community and Aboriginal housing in Beanley, and it's exactly the same thing. You just have to rely on the benevolence, the friendship, or who you know from one government to the next. And there's no actual structural way for you to influence uh, decisions that are made about resource allocation and about laws and policies. It's, it's a really tough um, experience out there for our people right across the continent. So in concluding, I'd like to say that the Uluru Statement from the Heart calls for a voice. That statement was the, the product of structured yarning by our people across this country. It is the product of a consultation process 
which was unprecedented in Australian history. No process has ever been conducted in relation to the Australian Constitution since it was first debated in the 1890s. It was the result of a robust sampling of our mobs from across the country. It's the product of a carefully designed process that marries practi practical principles of modern democracy with an understanding of how our cultures connect to each other. Set that against the misinformation churned out by those associated with no. Misinformation is an attack on the foundation of our democracy. It is an attack on the integrity of our electoral system. All they need to do is put misinformation out and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Confused? Then vote no. To have both the process in which the voice was conceived and the way in which it should operate be called undemocratic is untrue and harmful. But we should never lo lose sight of the fact that this is a distraction. Distraction is a ploy. It's a ploy because they cannot engage on matters of substance and fact. For example, that they presided over eight years of policy that increased red tape and increased bureaucracy in Indigenous communities. They can't answer the policy questions. They barely know the policy issues. So they distract with claims such as the Uluru Statement is 26 pages. The potential of the voice is to unite, for it to drive positive and lasting change in our communities, for it to cut through inefficient red tape, for it to speak directly to government and the parliament, for it to promote and bring into view the inherent rights of mob as the first peoples of this country, for it to brighten our future. And I'm going to end by reading the Uluru Statement, which is one page, by the way. Um, if it was any longer, we would have called it the Uluru Tapestry. Eddie's looking at me going, don't tell the joke. Um, or if it was longer, the Uluru War and Peace. But the notion of First Nations peoples or Indigenous peoples issuing one-page statements to the executive in, in many countries is a common tradition. And the Uluru Statement is no different. I, I wanted to begin reading it by referencing something Paul said about Kamragunja. Um, my own people come from a mission uh, three hours north of Brisbane called Sherberg. And I was really struck by what you said, um, that, that, they, that they were like detention centres. That is what reserves and missions looked like in the protection era. And this country, through history and law, they refer to it as, as the protection era because it sounds much more benign than detention which is what it was. It was compulsory racial segregation and for many, many mobs it was brutal. It was brutal. And I was just thinking about what you said because I think we, might, we had a rule in the Uluru Dialogues that the participants needed to be in the criteria, 60% had to be our elders. It had to be our elders because we are a gerontocracy as a culture as communities, it is our old people who are the leaders and carry the wisdom. And we made a rule that it must be 60% elders, cultural authority, traditional owners. And they all spoke about the reserve and mission time, the protection time. And I remember getting to a certain point in the process where they decided that we would issue a statement to the Australian people as an invitation to them to walk with us and that this invitation would be a logic, an explanation to Aussies as, what, as to why we think structural reform through a referendum was so important. And I often think about that at night as we get closer and closer, 
that despite everything that happened to our old people, despite everything that happened on our missions and reserves, our old people decided to issue an expression of love to the Australian people. After everything they've been through, they decided to issue a sign of peace and a roadmap to peace. It's an extraordinary gesture to the Australian people. And I'll end by reading it tonight. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention coming from all points of the southern sky make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise? That peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country and we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Megan Davies, for sharing the history of the referendum for constitutional recognition. It's a practical mechanism for the views of our communities to have a voice on matters that affect our lives. And it's been a 12 year long journey. You highlight the importance of the voice for, for the Australian democracy and for our nation to meet basic human rights. The voice is about power, it's about consultation and, and it's about giving us a seat at the table. Thank you for dispelling some of the myths and clarifying some of the rumours, the misinformation and the disinformation and for, for reminding us we can't always rely on Facebook as a reliable source. <laughs> We have been begging the Australian Government for the rights of our people. As you and Uncle Paul say, relying on who you know and acts of benevolence. Currently there is no structure way to influence the resource allocations for our communities. We're selling our, our, our economy is built off selling our disadvantage. There must be a better way. So when we go to the polls in eight weeks, people have the right to vote how they choose. It's important to make an informed decision and we want to thank Professor Davis for taking the time out of her busy schedule to come here this evening to help inform us. So thank you again. I'd now like to introduce Alistair Thorpe to deliver the closing remarks. Alistair Thorpe is a Guna Yordi Yorda, Gunda Jamara, uh, Wurundjeri Wurrung, Wurrung <laughs> man, living in Nam, Melbourne, and has many family and community relationships. Alistair is the Alma Thorpe Senior Research Fellow at Moonda. Bullock Victoria University and a member of the Loicha Institute's Community Research Network, Australia's National Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research. He is interested in research ethics, social and cultural determinants of health, data sovereignty and Indigenous cultural governance. He is an elected member of the First People's Assembly of Victoria, an independent body that represents the traditional owners of country and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Victoria. Alistair is committed to strengthening First Peoples' voices, protecting First Peoples' rights and supporting the aspirations of First Nations. Please make Alistair feel welcome for the closing. Thanks, Raylene. I wasn't expecting my bio to be read out. Um, I just want to thank Megan Davis for an amazing speech. Um, how do you follow the Uluru Statement? I'm going to try. So, but really important, timely oration. Um, I've got some notes here, but I'll, you know, in summary around the rights of First Peoples to participate in decision making, to practice self determination. You've given us a better understanding about the functions of a proposed voice to parliament and for fact checking, you know, such an important piece of work at this time. So, but I'll try to sort of give a bit of a summary of what you've given us. So my name is Alistair Thorpe. I'm a Yorta Yorta man. Well, actually, before I do that, I just want to thank Uncle Cole, all my elders in the room, um, family and friends here today. Um, I just want to acknowledge that too. Um, so my name is Alistair Thorpe. I'm a Yorta Yorta man through my mother and my grandparents. I'm also Gunai through my father's country to the east, Gundis Jamara through my grandmother's country in Western Victoria, and Wurundjeri Wadarung through my great grandfather's country. Um, so I acknowledge Yorta Yorta country, our people, our ancestors and our elders. I pay respect to my Yorta Yorta elders past and present. And I especially want to acknowledge my grandmother, Doris Atkinson, Nee Briggs Cooper, and my late grandfather, Neville Atkinson. Um, you know, my mum's here today too. I want to acknowledge my mum in the room. She's moved back to country after living in Melbourne for a long time. And so our connection here is strong. I've got lots of family that live up here. Also, Uncle Paul here too. I'm like, if I keep looking around, I'm going to keep talking about people, so I won't do that. But I just want to respect Uncle Paul. Um, but our people are the first peoples, the traditional owners, the custodians, the protectors of this land. We belong to this country. 
and this referendum is the culmination of a long political struggle. My experience of political, political activism is embedded in my family history and is a legacy that we have carried over generations. In World War I, my Gunai grandfather, Henry Thorpe, died fighting for this country, a country that did not recognise him, like so many other Aboriginal warriors. My great-grandparents were part of the Cumra walk-off, like many of our families. Some of my family members were taken and were part of the stolen generation. Uh, as a little fellow in primary school, 1988, I rejected the Bicentennial Medal in front of class. Like That was one of my first introductions to political activism. And I explained the meaning of the Aboriginal flag to my classmates. So I've been learning from a, for a long time about how do we advocate, how do we you know, do that. Um, in 1992, my high school that had the most Aboriginal kids in Melbourne was closed by the government and I was part of the fight to get it reopened. You know, like many of us, I have been to countless marches and protests, fighting for our rights. We are here because of the history of our activism, our struggle, because of our Aboriginal leaders and our elders, our strong women and our strong men. They were the ones that resisted. They were the ones that fought, struggled and protested and survived. It is because of their fight we are here now. This is an important moment for our country. Historically, governments have broken many promises, but to make them accountable, we must keep going back to the table with them. That is why in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to the parliament needs to be enshrined. That cannot be broken easily. Everyone has the right to their own opinion and the right to vote how they see fit, but it will take collective leadership for us to create lasting change. I will be voting yes because I believe this is our path towards self-determination. An Aboriginal voice will not solve every issue, but our people will decide who those voices are. And it will give us a platform to advise on policies that affect us. A yes vote is a step in the right direction for this country. It is just the beginning of a long conversation. Our political struggle will continue, but collective solidarity will strengthen our political advocacy. Governments can say no, and they will, but a voice will contribute to and influence the political environment. And I respond to Megan's, we deserve a seat at the table. We deserve a voice. Together we are stronger and our collective voice is louder. We have the right to be recognised and respected as sovereign first people. We have the right to represent our families, our communities and our tribes on our own lands. A collective voice is the first step. The time for change is now. This referendum is built on years of political struggle and activism. It is more than a symbolic gesture. A yes will change the Australian political landscape. Change is challenging, but it is necessary to grow and develop. We need to listen to different perspectives, consider other worldviews and empathise with different lived experiences to, con to challenge and broaden our own ideas and thinking. Structural reform is what Australia needs to become a great nation, not just a good one. Embedding an Aboriginal voice into the constitution will shape the Australian identity. It will demonstrate that we are an inclusive and progressive and fair nation for peoples of all colours and backgrounds. It represents formal recognition of Aboriginal people. This will bring all of us who call Australia home closer together. Caring for country, kinship and family, upholding community obligations, respect for elders are important values that we all share. This referendum will be decided by the Australian people. In the past, the Australian people overwhelmingly supported the 1967 referendum. Once again, it is time for the Australian people to fight for our rights, to give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the First Peoples, a fair go and recognise our rightful place in this country. We must shift from the deficit to empowerment to address inequality. And I just want to finish by saying the voice is about principle, the principle of inclusion and recognition. 
and principles support practice. In Victoria, we have seen what a collective voice can achieve. It has enabled us to make great progress towards treaties and truth-telling. It has supported the recognition of our rights as First Peoples. Other mobs around the country deserve to have a voice too. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair, for providing that spot-on closing remarks for this evening's event. Before I invite Uncle Paul Briggs and Professor Duncan Maskell back to the podium to present the thank you gifts, I just want to say um, events such as this take months of preparation and organisation, and we want to thank the staff of the University of Melbourne of the Rumbalara Football Netball Club in particular, KL Institute, Ruth, Angelina and Rebecca, who I witnessed putting 200 chair covers on each of the chairs here tonight. <laughs> um, thank you to all of the people who worked tirelessly to pull this evening together and for those who have travelled, particularly long distances, to get here. We also would like to send our well wishes to Annie K. Briggs and wish her a speedy recovery. Also, um, in finishing, post-COVID, many sporting clubs are struggling. And I just want to encourage you all to get behind the Rumbalara Football Netball Club in 2024. Get a membership, volunteer where you can. We are short on senior players. I don't know if the president's still here and wants to give a bit of a plug. <laughs> Next year is going to be one of our most exciting years with the Manara build as well. So I'll just invite now um, Professor Maskell and Uncle Briggs to provide a gift to our keynote speaker. I think one of the flowers may be for Belinda, if you wanted to come up. <laughs> and also for Deborah. So there will be some refreshments served if you want to hang around and mingle for a little while. We will get all of the presenters for this evening to stay at the stage. <laughs> Thanks very much. Safe travels home and enjoy your night.